As we've introduced government into the circular flow diagram, we've seen that governments purchase goods and services in output markets because they provide public goods. And in order to fund those public goods, they have to raise tax revenue. But we've also seen that governments engage in transfers, where transfers don't involve the purchasing of goods and services, but just the writing of checks to people. Now, transfers might be motivated by efficiency concerns. In the presence of positive externalities, we know that markets produce too little. And so governments could use transfers in the form of subsidies to encourage markets to produce closer to the efficient quantity. But most transfers in the real world are not motivated by efficiency concerns. Instead, they're motivated by equity concerns. Governments worry about poverty, and so they'd like to use transfers to alleviate poverty. Or they're worried about income inequality, and they'd like to use transfers to alleviate income inequality. In other words, governments use transfers to affect the income distribution. They're engaged in what we'll call income redistribution. So we're going to want to ask, well, how much income redistribution would we actually want the government to engage in? But before we can really ask that question, we have to ask what's actually possible. And that takes us to a topic we're going to call the social possibility curves. Now, we've talked about production possibility curves before, where we put goods on the horizontal and vertical axis. And we ask the question, if all of society's resources were used to produce those two goods, what combination of quantities would actually be possible? But now we're going to ask a different question. Instead of putting goods on the axis, we're going to put the well-being of different people on the axis. So we'll assume that there are two types of people, type 1 and type 2. And since we can't really measure well-being very well, we're instead going to use something that we can actually measure. We could use income or consumption or wealth, but let's just use income. So on the horizontal axis, we'll have the income for type 1 people, and on the vertical axis, we'll have the income for type 2 people. And we'll start with the point that the economy will take us to if we do nothing. If we don't redistribute any income, we might end up at a point like this, where the economy simply channels resources to the two types. So in this case, type 1 people would have a lot more income than type 2 people. Now we can ask, well, what would the social possibility curve look like? if we redistribute it. And we'll begin by assuming that we can use efficient redistribution. By efficient redistribution, we mean that we can take a dollar from one person and give that whole dollar to another person. We lose nothing in the process. Well, in that case, it's pretty easy to figure out what the social possibility curve would look like. Every time we take a dollar away from a type 1 person, we give that dollar to a type 2 person. And so we get a social possibility curve that's just a straight line going through the point that we would be at if we did nothing and has a slope of minus 1. But we know that in the real world, the tools that we use to redistribute are distortionary taxes and subsidies. And distortionary taxes and subsidies give rise to deadweight loss there are inefficient forms of redistributing. So if we redraw this, we can now ask, well, what would that imply for the shape of the social possibility curve? We'll have type 1 income on the horizontal axis, type 2 income on the vertical axis. And we'll again start with our starting point. If we did nothing, we'd end up at some point like this. Now, if we just put this into the picture, it can guide us to thinking about where will we be if we use inefficient redistribution. Well, one point that we know would still lie on the social possibility curve would be the point where we do nothing. We could simply stay at that point and do nothing. But as we redistribute away from type 1 people to type 2 people, we're not going to be able to reach that 
green line that forms the efficient level of redistribution. We'll lose the deadweight loss in the process. So we'll get a social possibility curve that looks more like this. And because deadweight losses increase geometrically as tax rates increase, the gap between the efficient redistribution line and the actual one using inefficient redistribution is going to grow the more redistribution we undertake. That gap is the measure of the deadweight loss. But things could get even more dramatic than that. Remember back when we talked about taxes and tax revenue? We mentioned the Laffer curve. So the Laffer curve has tax rates on the horizontal axis and tax revenue on the vertical. And we could think, for example, about income tax rates that could go from zero to 100%. Now, if we don't have any income taxes, and those are the only taxes we use for redistributing, we could not redistribute at all, and we get tax revenue of zero. As we increase the tax rate, tax revenue is going to rise. But we know eventually it's going to fall back to zero. Because if we employ 100% tax rates, then there's no point to generating any income. You would, still, you would just be handing it over to the government. So we know we're going to end up back here if we impose 100% income taxation. So at some point we're going to reach a peak, and if we raise tax rates anymore after that point, tax revenues actually fall. So what would that imply for our social possibility curve? Again, we'll have type 1 income on the horizontal axis, type 2 income on the vertical axis, and we start with the point that the economy takes us to where we do no redistribution whatsoever. But now, as we redistribute, we're going to incur those deadweight losses, but eventually we're going to actually collect less and less revenue for redistribution until we collect no revenue at all. And we're back to type 2 people having what they started with. So we're going to get a curve that looks more like this if we incorporate insights from the Laffer curve. So depending on how inefficient our redistribution instruments are, we might get different kinds of shapes for the social possibility curves. But the fact that we are using inefficient mechanisms for redistributing means that there is a cost of redistribution. There is a benefit because we're trying to achieve an objective of either alleviating poverty or reducing income inequality, but there's also a cost because we use inefficient ways of redistributing from one person to another.